Welcome to Careers in Information Technology, part of the TomTom Tom Foundation's Classroom to Boardroom series this week. My name is Lily Garcia Walton. I'm Chief People Officer of Silverchair, and I will be your facilitator for today. Uh, before we begin our conversation with our panelists, I want you to take a few moments to answer the poll that will be appearing on your screen momentarily. This is going to give us just a better idea of the composition of our audience and allow our panelists to better tailor the information they share. So please just take a couple of moments and um, let us know uh, who you are and where you are in your career. Great, so we're, we, our audience is largely experienced professionals seeking a career transition as well as mid-career professionals. And I saw in the chat, we forgot to add retiree to the list of choices. So we also have at least one retiree in our audience. Thank you so much, Rich, for pointing that out. Uh, the purpose of our panel today is to provide some insights into career development in information technology, technology, not just for job seekers and career changers, but also for employers who are just simply looking to enhance their own strategies. I am going to invite our panelists to answer a series of questions and you are invited to use the chat function at all times during our time together to ask questions of your own as well. Our panelists are going to respond to your questions as they are able, and we might even elevate some questions to ask the panelists from the chat. At the conclusion of our panel, um, those who are interested are also invited to join a career development expo, and I'll remind you about that and we'll drop a link in the chat about it at the very end. And during that expo, you'll be able to participate in some one-on-one -on -one resume reviews as well as mock interviews. So let's go ahead and begin. I would first love for each of our panelists to provide an introduction of themselves and their organizations and to say a few words about their approach to recruiting. And for that, I would love to go first to Sierra from Co-Construct. Could you go ahead and kick us off? Definitely. Thank you, Lily. Hi, everyone. Welcome again. My name is Sierra Ingram. I am the talent and business partner at Coke Construct. I specialize in helping businesses and people grow um, their career and, and um, a lot of opportunity. Coke Construct, we are a software as a service company founded in Charlottesville, um, 2004, and we have been growing ever since then. Um, we help residential builders and remodelers with technology. So um, we're a technology company for the construction industry, um, and um, that's what we do. We provide a solution to businesses um, in that industry. So that's a little bit about co-construct. And then when it comes to my approach for recruitment, being in talent for almost 10 years, I really feel like um, recruiting is, is like sales. Um, that, that's pretty much my approach. You're selling yourself, you're selling your business values, your beliefs, um, the culture, and you want to go into it as that, you know, put your best foot forward as well as um, know a lot about what, what you want to buy or what you want to get into. So I would say that would be my best pro approach for um, recruitment. Is, is treat it like sales. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Sierra. Uh, uh, Liam, a little bit about you and Bluestone Analytics and, and maybe a little something about how you think about selling your organization to recruits in your hiring process. Sure, yeah, thanks Lily and, and thanks for, for Tom Tom for, for setting up this, this talk and inviting me. Um, so uh, my name is Liam Bowers, I'm the CEO of Bluestone Analytics. Uh, Bluestone Analytics is a dark web technology company uh, focused on supporting uh, the U.S. Uh, national security mission. Um, we are based in Charlottesville, have about 35 employees uh, based right on the downtown mall for those of you uh, in the Charlottesville area. Um, and, you know, our, our approach to, to hiring is, uh, you know, kind of like Sierra said, very, very much like a sales uh, focused approach. Um, we as a government-focused uh, company are competing with some of the largest companies in the world. I mean, and, and even in Charlottesville, Booz Allen, Khaki, like it is a very competitive environment. And we grew our team from about 15 to 35 over the course of the last 12 months. So um, that was tough to do during, you know, COVID obviously. Uh, and and that uh, 
Um, yeah, it has been a very competitive talent environment for sure, even during uh, the, the kind of economic downturn that we saw. So. Well, that's, that's impressive, Liam. So you managed to double your company uh, during a pandemic and in competition with some of these really big, well-known names. So what's your secret sauce? It really just comes down to uh, the, the folks applying to our company and, and moving through the, the talent onboarding process, aligning their goals for their career with, with the mission of our companies and uh, our company and how we support our, our various clients. So it's really about finding that, that kind of alignment and what they want to do and, and what we're doing uh, in, in our business. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Liam. Um, Christy, a little bit about you and Willow Tree and your approach to recruitment. Sure. Uh, my name is Christy Phillips. I'm the Chief Talent Officer at Willow Tree. Willow Tree is a digital product agency. Um, we were founded in Charlottesville. Our headquarters is in Charlottesville. Um, we also have offices in Durham, North Carolina, and Columbus, Ohio. And uh, we work with companies like HBO, PepsiCo, National Geographic to build um, their mission critical digital products. And we, um, we have a now really wide range of services, which means that we have a wide range of roles. Um, and I think that's one thing, sometimes uh, people have a really narrow focus of what it means to work in technology. But you know, in addition to designers and developers, we also have strategists and you got, you, um, user researchers and uh, analytics and growth marketing. And so there's a really wide array of, uh, of careers. That, that we offer. Um, when it comes to recruiting, we, so we have a pretty robust uh, university um, early career recruiting program. And then we also really recruit nationally um, and relocate people uh, to our different locations. And I would say in terms of recruiting, um, you know, like Liam was saying, it's, the talent that that we need to hire is in such high demand. And so you really have to think about what is your value proposition? You know, what are you offering? Why are these people who could get jobs in so many places going to come work for you? And so you have to have like a really crisp value proposition. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know, Christy. And uh, I go through this myself in my own job and in, in checking out the way that um, all of you are positioning your organizations, it really does seem like you, um, you're you speaking to the values of your organization, the importance of culture, the way that you engage your employees, uh, the flexibility that you offer your workforce and what it means to work in this wonderful metropolis of ours. Is that, is that a fair representation of how you're thinking about representing the value proposition of your organization? Uh, for us, definitely. You know, you, you've got to think about what, what is important to the type of person that you want to hire and then, you know, what sets your organization apart. So, you know, focus on career growth and professional development and um, a great culture to work in and interesting work to do. Um, those are all things and in locations where, I mean, we very intentionally uh, locate our offices in places that are not huge tech hubs, but that have good tech talent, but what they really offer is a high quality of life. And so unlike the tech hubs, you can buy a home and have, you know, a 10 minute commute to work if, if that's what you want. So that's what we really focus on. Thank you. So yeah, really focusing on the total package and the quality of the experience for your people. And uh, I thank you for that. And uh, Robin, I'd love to hear from you because I know you're sitting at a really busy intersection where you're getting to know a lot of career changers and career seekers, as well as a lot of employers. So could you share a little bit about you and what you do and, and how you're thinking about recruitment strategy? Yeah, what I do is like run around like a chicken without a head most of the time uh, lately. It's, it's pretty, uh, it's, uh, no, I, I, joking aside, it's actually a fantastic time to be doing what we're doing. And it's a real opportunity to do it in a particular way, in an intentional way to try and achieve um, positive outcomes for, for well-intentioned people. Um, so uh, what I do is uh, professionally is I, I lead uh, Myth Talent. And Myth Talent is, uh, we are an independent team 
of, of an independent team that was um, that serves the world essentially. But, um, but we were born uh, born in Charlottesville, and um, the team is distributed, but we all live in and around uh, Charlottesville presently. Um, <clears throat> and we there are two things that really distinguish Myth Talent. I think uh, the first one is that we invest in the perspective of um, experts who have uh, vast engineering expertise as well as significant technical leadership experience. So they work with us to help frame our searches uh, when we're working with our clients uh, to kick things off. Um, and they also play a key role in um, assessing candidates from a technical perspective and a cultural perspective as well. Um, the other thing that distinguishes us is really the key to Meth Talent, um, which is that um, in everything we do, in every conversation we have, our guidepost is the motivations of the individuals in the tech community. So um, from a sort of clinical business perspective, it makes great sense for everybody involved because supply and demand is such that there is way, there are way more seats available for say software engineers in particular than there are people to fill those seats. So treat the, treat the rare, the, re, the, the thing that's rare like gold, right? And try and give them precisely what they want the most. Um, but really it also, most importantly, what that means is that I can wake up and you know everybody on the team can look themselves in the mirror and know that we are steering people toward things that they're gonna find really fulfilling. Um, so our process is very simple. We just, we meet people, we learn what their goals are, and then we advise them eagerly and never with any charge for individuals. Um, Toward, uh, toward a path and that will help them to achieve what they want. And we do that without regard for whether that path leads to one of our clients. Um, and so we, in, in that essence, we treat the fees we, we earn as a byproduct of our process. You know, of course, we try and foster discussion with people who are likely to want what our, what our clients are offering, but um, that's not the essence of what we do. Um, so the, the best way I can explain it to clients, and it actually serves really well uh, for individuals, I think, is if you imagine a contentment scale of one to 10, with one being people who are um, actively looking, most likely jobless or essentially jobless. And then you know, eight, nine, and 10 are people who are extremely happy. Um, they are getting paid well. They like the people they work with. Well, actually, I should do that in a different order. They enjoy the people they work with. That's the most important one. And then in no particular order, they, they feel they're compensated fairly. Um, they're motivated by the mission and they enjoy the day-to-day -day experience. Um, our value is uh, to, to our clients is our, the relationships we build with people who are in the five to seven range. So these are people who are reasonably content uh, in their jobs and um, they can envision themselves there for another couple of years, but we learn what would make them an eight, nine or 10. And when we find it, we get back in touch. And that's the essence of what we do. That is fascinating, Robin. It sounds like, first of all, you're a great person for anyone on this call to know. So thank you for being here. Uh, so I'm, I'm hearing you say that you're looking for people who are not necessarily seeking to change jobs, but you're trying to find ways to upgrade their experience, to get them into someplace that's truly uh, special and a great match for who they are. Yeah, I th I th that's essentially correct. I mean, we we are just we're looking for people who, um, you know. Here's another thing. Um, sometimes we encounter people who don't really have a sense of what they want, and um, and I'll, we'll get into. I'll I think I'll get into this a little bit later uh, in our discussion. But um, helping people to create a sense of what they want is also sometimes a critical piece of what we do. But it's really interesting, you know, if you ask somebody um, what is most, so if you ask, so there's a list of things, right? It could be mission, it could be the size of the company, where it's located, the size of the team, the tech stack, et cetera, et cetera. But if you give people, if you deliver these prompts, you're never gonna really get a sense of what they want. But if you say to them, what's your ideal next job? The thing that they say first is very telling. Um, and that's where the most passionate answers are, for sure. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to you with a question about how you ensure equity in this process that you go through. I think that's a really interesting question, especially for your uh, custom process. For, for you, Liam, I'm, I'm especially interested in hearing that. I know that 
Bluestone Analytics is a veteran owned small business, right? And that's something that you really lead with. And I'm, I'm wondering how that influences how you think about equity in the hiring process. Yeah, uh, great question. So, <clears throat> um, you know, our, our approach to hiring, uh, especially over the last year, because we've been scaling up, because we've we've been doing, you know, way more interviews than we ever have in, in the history of the company. Um, we really, early on last year, we decided to take a very data-driven approach to, to how we bring people into the company and how we evaluate uh, skill sets. Um, so one of the things, uh, probably about this time last year, April, probably mid-April, um, we implemented a, a series of technical tests through a platform called Metal, which is the, the one that we selected. But it basically lets us, uh, in a completely unbiased way, evaluate the technical skills of the people applying to the company. And we uh, take any sort of identifying information out of that, that testing process. So that the first way that a hiring manager uh, gets a, a view of a potential candidate is by looking at the scores in that very objective um, uh, you know, online series of tests. And each test is very tailored to the, the type of position that, that, um, that, that we're hiring for. And we have found that that has been a really effective way at trying to take any sort of bias out of the hiring process. Now, I will say that with, with our type of company and the fact that we do a lot of classified work for the government, there are certain things that are just requirements from, from our clients. They have to be US citizens. You know, some positions require security clearances. You know, there's not much we can do about that. Um, cause it's a, you know, a government requirement, but, uh, we really try to do anything we can to, to make data driven decisions on who we bring into the company. Um, and, and that's one of the ways that we have been really successful at, at growing the team, uh, but, but maintaining as much diversity as we can. Thank you, Liam. So it, it sounds like you're really focused on stripping out any personal bias to ensure that you're evening the playing field and really ensuring an equitable experience for your job candidates. Is that right? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Eventually we have to do an interview, right? That, that's definitely a, right. a later step in the process. But right. you know, what we try really hard not to do is screen out potentially really good candidates early on for any sort of you know unconscious bias. Like that, I think um, the prevalence of online platforms that allows hiring managers and HR uh, directors to, to screen candidates in a very objective way, you know, using data, I think that's that's been a great uh, addition to all of our capabilities in, in the hiring world. Thank you for that. And, you know, to, over to you, Christy, I, Willow Tree's commitment to inclusion in the workplace is, is very well known. I know it's something that you strongly advocate and you're dedicated to. And I'm wondering how that shows up in your hiring process. Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned inclusion. Inclusion is actually one of our core values and we um, take our core values very much to heart. They're not just something on the wall. And actually um, our whole interview process is built around that. And I think that that was a real, um, that is something that I would advocate for any company to do, especially like small and growing. Um, it sounds like Liam's doing some, some great things to remove unconscious bias, but I think, uh, companies sometimes hire for what we call culture fit, which is a really dangerous thing to do, right? Because culture is culture fit means something different to everyone. And it's not really um, what makes someone qualified for a job. And it's, if it's a practice that can lead you to build a very non-diverse team. And so um, I think being aligned on something like core values and asking behavioral questions around that is a much more effective way um, to build a diverse team and to have an equitable um, interview process. I think, you know, some of the other things we do, so we, we have a pretty robust interview team internally, but people have to um, go through training to be on the interview team. And part of that is around unconscious bias. And, uh, and you sort of progress uh, through to different steps in the interview process as you, you know, get more experience and get comfortable with it and um, shadow people. And, and then some of the other things we do are like using tools internally to get everyone's um, feedback from the interview. And so everyone's instructed, you know, some days we have multi-step and a lot of different people are interviewing a candidate. 
and uh, we don't want them to bias each other. And so basically you record your um, feedback for the interview before you talk to anyone, right? So you're instructed not really to talk to anyone who interviewed the person that day and then you track that. So we, really we're always sort of looking for ways to remove bias from the interview process. On the flip side, I think some of the things you can do before, uh, you know, people even apply are to do things like really look at your job descriptions, right? Are they, are they focused on the qualifications that are really important for someone to do a good job and not uh, inflated? Because there have been studies that show that women will only apply to jobs where they meet almost 100% of the qualifications, right? And so if you have these job descriptions that are just full of every single thing you would like for a candidate to have, um, you could be, you know, narrowing your candidate pool from the get-go. Um, and I think another thing we do is really try to not include any education requirements unless it's absolutely necessary, right? So if we're hiring legal counsel, they need to have a law degree. But, um, you know, you don't necessarily need a degree for a lot of the jobs in our role. And so those are some of the things we think about um, in terms of building a diverse candidate pool, and then, um, you know, having a fair and equitable interview process. Thanks, Christy. I think it's fascinating that you're, you're deeply interrogating the use of education as a proxy for skills and qualifications. I think that's, that's something that I've noticed has only recently come into the consciousness widely of recruitment professionals that we've, we've defaulted forever to the idea that Oh, having at least a college degree, right? It, it demonstrates what? That you have internal motivation, that you have a baseline of understanding and knowledge relevant to the job. It just, it just isn't true, especially for careers in IT. And that's, it's, it's true for us at Silverchair. We're really just looking for people who can do the job. And right. what, you know, what degree you have is actually irrelevant. And, and many of our most successful professionals are career changers who were doing something completely different before and are largely self-taught. So I, I, I love that that's a way in which we can be groundbreaking in the way that we recruit. Agreed. Uh, and I, th I think that's what opens people's eyes, right? It's like yeah. you know, when your top performers don't have a computer science degree or, you know, something related, it's like, yeah, you not really necessary. Exactly, exactly. Well, uh, thank you for that, uh, for that list of different things that you're doing that it that is really kind of a where's Waldo of best practices and how to eliminate um, bias and create an equitable hiring process. And I'm wondering, Sierra, for you, like, wh what of this resonates with you? And how are you thinking about ensuring equity in your hiring process at co-construct? Yeah. Well, after hearing Liam and Christy, very similar um, mindset when it comes to using data as well as core values during our hiring process. We use, um, well, we do a personality assessment during our interview process. And for that, we're focused on looking at certain competencies that we find successful in certain roles. And that helps us um, like not screen out right in the beginning, as Liam said, it's hard to even get someone sometimes um, as a good candidate. So once you do get a great candidate, definitely getting them through the process. But one of our last screens, it would be an assessment to check out competencies and make sure they align um, for success for that role. And core values are so important. As Christy said, um, they really do speak um, to the company as well as to people coming in. When they hear um, we have values or I'm interviewing someone and they say, hey, I saw that on your website. That's super unique. That actually attracted me more to you guys to see that you care about someone who looks in the mirror first, takes accountability, normal things that you would think <laughs> everyone would have and care about. But um, just to even put it up there really does speak volumes to companies. Um, so I, I will say core values as well as using some data helps really ensure that you're um, trying to be fair and equitable in the process. Sierra, ha have you had any surprising results as you really lived into this commitment to equity in your hiring process? What are some of the things that you thought, huh, I didn't expect it to go that way? 
<laughs> well, you always get someone who's just maybe not a good test taker. Right? <laughs> they might not have done so well on the test. Um, and then that's when you definitely want to use that whole hiring team and bring in some other minds um, and make sure that you're not just using certain data or using um, other things to, um, to screen out your people, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I promised Robin I'd come back to you. Mm -hmm. I'm in, intrigued by the signature recruitment process that you've described. And so now in light of everything that the co-panelists have shared, what can you share with us about how you're ensuring equity in the way that you operate your process? Sure. Um, well, I mean, the greatest insurance is just sticking to what I described earlier, which is just meeting an individual um, as an individual and then learning what they want to achieve and then helping them to, to, to do it um, regardless of anything, you know? And so that, that's, that sort of um, sets us on the right course every time. Um, but, you know, speaking um, more specifically to the, to the topic, I mean, again, sort of clinically from the industry's perspective, right? If I were the industry's balance sheet with a mouth right now and I were talking, I would say that um, the two, two biggest problems, I think, are insufficient supply of talent and um, the, um, the, 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 the missed opportunities. Um, like when creativity and ingenuity that's limited by uh, this in lack of cross-cultural collaboration, right? Uh, differing perspectives. Um, it's not just it's not just hot air. Like it's a real thing to have different perspectives when you're building. You know, I don't care if you're B two B or B two C. There are people using it, right? There are people using it. There are people invested in it. There are people for whom that thing is going to be very important. Um, to whatever it is in their life, you know, that, that it's meant to serve. So um, having, having varied perspectives is, is so critical to success. So um, we at, at Myth, I mean, we do work with some, have historically and occasionally still do work with some large companies, but for the most part, we work with smaller growing companies that are, you know, startup in, you know, one stage or another. Um, and we're often asked very early on uh, to help us recruit for diversity. And I kind of annoy people who ask that question by responding with a question of my own, which is what have you done to prepare uh, to, to create an environment that will be equally, um, equally welcome, welcoming equal, you know, for, for anyone who walks through the door? And very often there's no good answer or there's no answer to that. It's more of like, you know, this well-intentioned people wanting to create a diverse workforce. And maybe they even have the, the positive outcomes that one can achieve by creating a diverse team uh, in mind. But um, too, too rarely are people thinking about um, the perspective of the person who's walking through the the door, whether it's a virtual door or an actual physical co-located door. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's natural to grow and there's nothing wrong with it. Like if you are a PhD student and you come up with, you know, with um, a groundbreaking technology along with a fellow PhD student and then you create a business, it makes perfect sense to hire, uh, to recruit the people you know, people you went to school with, um, that kind of thing. And, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. There really isn't. And there's nothing wrong with then at the point where you get some funding, you get some money and it's time to grow, um, to look around and say, you know, wow, we're, we all look the same. Um, and, and to want to change that. But um, what those people don't often see or, or just, you know, think to even look for is the fact that their last two company retreats were golf outings. Uh, or, you know, it's like it, it, they just don't see the things that are going to make some people uncomfortable, right? Um, they, you know, they do the things that are enjoyable to them and that's fine, but it just requires uh, adopting a different lens um, and, see, you know, and seeing the world through the eyes of, you know, like you're, you're growing a, a community essentially, you want to, um, and you want everyone to thrive within it. So you have to put yourself in that position. But I think the good news is that, um, that, divert, that this problem will, will will um, be ameliorated to a great degree soon because uh, number one, I mean, just evidenced by the fact that this is a question in this panel, demand has never been higher for people uh, in underrepresented 
communities, and also supply is 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 increasing. So um, the recruiting problem in tech is not for people who are very early in their career. It's for people who have advanced in their career and their senior level. That's where there's a dearth of, of talent, um, particularly in the startup community. So, um, so the, over the past several years, there have been people um, coming through programs like uh, uh, one I really like, and I, I have no skin in this game whatsoever, is, uh, I mean, they don't even know I exist, is uh, Grace Hopper. Um, it's a boot camp that's, that's um, if you look at it, it says, you know, I, something, something, you know, tech education for, or software development education for women plus, you know, and it's, it, it's, um, there, there are, there's a concerted effort to, uh, to, to provide people in underrepresented communities with these skills and they're advanced and they, in two, three, four years, they're going to be uh, senior level talent. And so there'll be a lot more, um, uh, a lot more uh, supply out there. So, so just to briefly, re briefly recap that demand for, uh, for people from underrepresented and underrepresented communities has never been higher and the supply is increasing and the senior level talent um, within those communities will in a few years be substantial, I think. Um, and so uh, the companies, so there's gonna be that supply there, but the companies that will flourish and the companies that will benefit from 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 it will be the ones that that do take a hard look at what what they're fostering and what kind of uh, experience um, and opportunities they're fostering for the people who walk through the door and uh, the ones who are just out you know even you know very much well intentioned want to recruit for diversity because it's the right thing to do that'll only go so far it's about looking internally and setting things up so that the community is is um, is, is equally inviting to everybody. I, I couldn't agree more, Robin. In my experience, the problem is rarely recruiting for diversity. It's actually fostering an environment of belonging that allows you to retain diverse employees and allow them to thrive. I'm, I'm wondering, Sierra, Christy, Liam, is there anything that you would add to that from your experience? I would say one thing when I am trying to make sure that I include um, diverse and underrepresented groups during the interview processes, I just try to network and connect with local um, nonprofit organizations that are really um, focused on that. Seville Women of Tech, love um, that I've connected with them and really trying to help um, foster that and, and grow um, in that um, area as well as um, just focused on those those groups, yeah, and, and minority groups as well, and just networking with them and having a pipeline of um, people interested in keeping good communication and, and contact with them. I think that's really important. Um, as Robin said, it, we know that there is a shortage of these uh, of this type of talent and in culture and diversity. And so, being proactive as a recruiter, I, I find it really important for me to connect with different groups that are underrepresented and, and try to. Um, you know, show that we, we do care. And, and it does come from leadership and, and uh, all places. Yeah, I think Robin hit it on the head when he said, I mean, you can build a diverse team, but if you don't have an inclusive environment and a place where everyone feels um, valued and respected, you, you won't have a diverse team for long, right? So um, it's hiring people from underrepresented groups or you know building diverse teams is the front half of it and keeping those people um is all about you know how what the culture is like um on the inside of the company well i'd, I'd love to pivot to a question that caroline asked before our brief interlude and has, has asked again, helpfully. Thank you so much, Caroline. I'm wondering what you might recommend to adults who work in high schools who are trying to foster interest in careers in IT. Um, how can they do their part? Leah, you look like you're deep in thought, so I'm gonna go to you. <laughs> sure. Um... So a couple things that, that come to mind immediately. I mean, 
I think the past year uh, has been a great example of why um, it, it, you know, this is the perfect time to, to get started with a career in technology. Um, you know, for the types of positions that we recruit for, uh, mm -hmm. machine learning engineers, uh, data engineers, uh, high-end software developers, um, all the people that we brought onto our team had four or five competing offers, right? Mm -hmm. There was no lack of opportunity for people in the in the tech world during COVID, right? And this is, you know, one of the the most challenging economic times in, in all of our lives, right? So, this, I mean, if if nothing else is a good example, like people with those skills had incredible opportunity even during the past year. So, I mean, if you know, if I were advising high school kids or junior high kids now, I mean, it's there's so much opportunity, and and you will have probably endless opportunities and, and a very stable career going forward. Um, so I would just kind of use that as a, a good case study for why this is a great field to get into. Mm -hmm. Would you add anything to that, Sierra? Yeah, and participating. I know there are some really cool um, nonprofit organizations here in Charlottesville that works with high school students. Um, Tech tour, is that what it is? I, um, we participated a year or two ago at Co-Construct where we had high school students come in and spend the day with our UX designers and figure out, oh my gosh, like there's design in technology. Like I can be creative too. I can have an art interest in and be a developer or not a developer, but be a part of the development team. And so um, I find just getting kids involved at a really young age and looking out to what the community has to offer because there are some pretty um, cool groups here in the area that could help out um, when it comes to high school students um, and the local community college too. I believe that they um, do some really cool stuff. Um, PVCC just had a career expo for their high school students and um, we actually participated in that and two or three of our developers um, showed um, a team or the high school students um, locally on how to um, set up an app and how we create an app and we just um, were able to, I think just the more you put that in front of their face and they hear about, like Liam said, like how much like there is a need for this. Like when you get out of work, you'll get a job and you'll get a good paying job. Um, I think people need to hear that too right now. A lot of us, a lot of young people are going through and seeing their families go through difficult times. And then, you know, people are gonna wanna come out of this being able to provide for their family even more. And I think that's like another, another great thing too. Thank you, Sierra. We have time for just one more question before we transition to our uh, career exploration panel. And uh, maybe I'll kick this over to you, Christy. In a minute or two, what is the most important thing for job seekers and career changers to keep in mind right now about careers in IT? And it could be something that's hot right now or something that's forever important, but what's the one piece of advice that you would give? I would say that a career in technology is really within anyone's grasp. If this is something that you want to do, um, the information is there and it could take months. It could take a year of, of learning and doing this on the side and on your own, but it, it's so attainable. And so if it's something that you want, um, you know, start working at it, go after it and understand that, um, you know, understand your worth and understand that, you know, once you get those skills um, that you're, you're going to find a place in, in the tech uh, community. And um, as everyone's been saying, it's, it's something worth attaining, right? And not only um, for the fact that there are great jobs and you get compensated well, but it's interesting work and it's something that where you can keep evolving yourself and challenging yourself. Thank you, Christy. Liam, how about you? The one thing that you would leave our job seekers and career changers with? Sure. I mean, I think being in technology, uh, there is almost a requirement for continuing to learn and continue to grow in your, in your profession, in your career. Um, technology, as we all know, changes really quickly. Um, and especially if you're looking for a job or looking to switch into technology um, for a career, like you have to continuously brush up on your skills because your skills and technology can get, um, you know, stale quickly. And, and it's on uh, it's on job seekers to, to make sure that they're at least uh, familiar with the, the modern 
uh, technology stack that everybody's using. So um, keep your claws sharp. Yep. <laughs> uh, Sierra, what's the one thing you would share with? Our yeah, I would say during the interview process, when you're applying for a position, you might not have any experience in the entry level positions to get into companies. That's a good start. And I will say a lot of people join co-construct and they come in an entry level position and work their way right on up. And so if you see a position and you might be a little overqualified, still apply, like you don't know what can happen. So I always encourage people to apply for positions you might be a little overqualified for because you don't know what that need is. You don't know that company's pain until you actually have an interview. And then when you do have an interview, listen, like that's my biggest thing, listen and research. Make sure you know what the companies, what they have going on, what they have a need for, really study that job description, and then listen to what the interview is saying or interviewer is saying. Because a lot of times I'll say, oh, we're so busy. We needed a web developer yesterday and we need this and that. And if you speak to what they say and the pain points that the interviewer is like speaking about, they're going to listen to certain things you say. Um, and, and that's really important. So being super clear um, and also um I can show you during your research. I think those, those are really important and um, just going for it. Just go for positions, you know. Yeah, I love it. Just go for it and do your homework and be prepared to answer those questions. Um, uh, uh, Robin, what would you say? Sure. Um, yeah, so I would say um, by far the most important thing um, in my mind when advising someone who is, whether they're entering the field, transitioning to a new field, or um, even just moving on from wherever they are in the field and staying roughly in the same realm. Um, it, it's, it's instinctual for people to want to cast a wide net. Um, and there are a couple of problems with that process. So if this represents the, the borders around the things that you're going to find truly fulfilling, casting a wide net means this, right? So even just mathematically, the, the odds that you're going to end up outside of your, of your, of your strike zone are high, and that's a really big deal, especially if you're transitioning into a new career. You're, you're, you're creating a foundation that's inherently unfulfilling for yourself or inherently not as fulfilling as it could be. So I really encourage people to, to narrow their, their parameters, not cast a wide net, but instead um, you know, undertake a process that will, so I think if you do this, you increase the likelihood of a positive outcome, but you also increase the number of options that you can create for yourself. Um, and so just really quickly, um, so you can summarize this. So the idea is to, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to tell you what I'm describing without using the very unpleasant word that most people use to describe it. And I'll use the word at the end, but it's um, create something, right? Um, it could be for a software engineer, it could be writing an application, right? Um, uh, it could be writing a blog post. Um, and then discern who's gonna be excited about it, who has common interests, which companies, which, which leaders within those companies are going to be interested in the thing that you just built because you really like it, right? Because you really enjoyed the process of building it. And then take that thing with you and engage in discussion with people and use it as your key to open the door. You like, and so that thing of value that you create might be that, you know, um, I, um, I, I see something I, you know, by the way, Christy, I don't know if you write, maintain a blog, but I'm just going to use you. For example, if you maintain, if, if I saw that Christy maintained a blog and I was very interested in what she wrote, um, I might, and she references a book in that, in that blog post, the thing of value that I create might be going out and reading that book and then approaching her and saying, hey, I'd really like to join your, well, actually, you don't even have to say, I'd like to join your team. You just say, I was really struck by what you wrote, so much so that I read this book. And I was wondering if we can just chat. And then you're not even asking for a job, you're just engaging in discussion with people who have common interests and you're bringing value to the discussion. So the, that nasty word that I was avoiding was networking because people usually just think of like, hello, my name is Tags and you know, and, <laughs> Um, anyway, so, and then the last thing is um, don't, per don't ever pursue something because of what it might do for you later. The future is an abstraction. It doesn't exist. Instead, concentrate on your day-to-day -day experience. Uh, concentrate on putting yourself in a position to create things that you enjoy creating alongside people who whose company you uh, enjoy. And then as a natural result of that, you will be the best version of yourself that you can be, right? It's like saying, 
uh, asking someone in high school, do you want to, what do you want to be? And they say, I want to be a brain surgeon. And you say, why? And they say, well, because of that Mercedes I'm going to buy. And then you might say, well, what about the next 16 years of training? Uh, and they're like, oh, well, you know, I mean, so it's just focus on the experience, focus on the people you'll be working with. Um, that, so that would be the second part. Um, Robin, thank you. Well, I'm going to let you have the last word. Thank you for closing us out on such an uplifting note. What I, what I got is, first of all, careers in IT are deeply rewarding, so go for it. Um, you can do it, but be prepared during that interview, right? And make sure that you're keeping your claws sharp because the technology can and does change constantly. And um, create something of value and look for connections to that thing. So that that is just incredibly good and timely advice. So thank you, Liam, Robin, um, Sierra, and Christy for sharing your insights and your guidance and, um, and the philosophies and the lessons that you've learned over your years of experience. I also wanna thank the organizations that are going to be hosting the Career Development Expo that we're about to transition to. For those who are interested, the link is now in the chat and that's coming up next. Uh, Shift Enters Leadership is going to be moderating the main room and our interview and resume sessions will be headed by Albemarle Company Information Technology, Co-Construct, NWG Solutions, Riddle Burger Brothers, Spire Collective, Tech Dynamism, UVA Temps, and Willow Tree. So uh, thank you so much to everybody who joined us today. Thank you for choosing to spend your afternoon with us. Good luck and we wish you all the best. Yeah.